Just talk about that. Just talk about that. So this is the reference picks that I've been working on, and our very first question was, what are we gonna do with the fact that Ragnaros doesn't really have legs? I mean, she has her spider legs, but the equivalent of my human legs are kind of cut. So the first thing that we thought is that maybe, and that's what most of people have as an idea, maybe I could hide my legs inside the body of the spider, but then it means that I would have had to either be sitting very vertical, or if I wanted to be really like Ragnera and have my body coming out from, from the spider's body, I would have been to be like a little bit like this. And I was like, think yeah. about it. How will it be physically possible for me to hold my body in that position, like half laying on my belly in the, in the air with my legs hiding in, in the spider's body? It just won't happen. It's just impossible. So we decided that the easiest way to go would be to have me sitting in front of the spider and we would find later a way to integrate my legs into the design or to hide them one way or another. But the only possibility for us seemed to be to have me sitting on a seat integrated in the body of the spider itself. So that was the first big technical issue that we had. We did exactly like what we did with the, the robot. We started with the 3D model of the spider, and we had that 3D model sliced in a, a free software that you, get, get, that you can find online that is called one to 3 d Make. So it allows you to take your 3D model and to slice it up, just like you would do with an apple. So you have slices of your 3D model that we were able to send for printing, like big plans, like, like, like those big prints that you have when you have the plans of your house or something like that. So like infinite slices of a 3D model printed, and we glued the, uh, those slices on um, styrene boards that we don't use anymore for, I don't even know why they, they still sell this in the hardware store, because that's not what we use to isolate our houses anymore. So I think that they sell it mainly for people who want to do crafts project with them. So we used those styrene sheets, cut the slices with a jigsaw, and we were able to later glue the slices on top of each other, stack them on top of each other, and recreate the body of the spider. The whole point of doing this uh, is that um, the real techniques, the real efficient technique to do a big styrene sculpture are very expensive. The real way to go, if I would have had an infinite budget, would have been to purchase big blocks of styrens, and you have technical styrens that are made especially for sculpture. Some of them are so amazing, it's like carving wood, but they are insanely expensive. And then you, you have your 3D model, and you send it to a company that has a 5 axis CNC, and the CNC just basically sculpts your model in, in the big siren block. So that's the real way to go. If I was a big company with an infinite budget, I would have had sent my 3D model to a CNC company, have it sculpted in a, a big siren block. I could cover it with, not, not necessarily even fiberglass, I, I could use like a, other sprayable plastics like polyurea, and that would be it. My sculpture would be ready to be painted. So there are very quick and efficient ways to do a big fiberglass or a big statue. So there are way easier and efficient ways to do big sculptures like that. They were just not affordable for the budget we had. So we took like all those detours to make something that, that could have been so much easier. So. I'm showing this to you because I mean it, it, it's a convention. And, but if I was showing this technique to professionals who make sculptures, they would probably be laughing at us so hard because this is not the proper way to make a big fiberglass sculpture. You can go to the next picture. So you already see that it, it looks like half of the body. You recognize the shapes, but we had the problem that there is all those little steps, all the corners, due to the fact that we're working with slices. So we had to um, use files, like like to, to do grated carrots. What's that? That's the same name? Yeah, files. And to uh, remove those little steps. 
So uh, the funny part about this is that uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, stink, it doesn't itch. You're not working with fiberglass already, not yet, but it makes styrene pellets everywhere, everywhere. But when I did the robot, I needed four bundles of 12 four by can't pay with four by eight sheets of of siren. So like those four big bundles of, of, of fiberglass sheets came in in my workshop and they came out in, 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 garbage, ba in garbage badges and little pellets. So at some point I had 60 garbage badges of styrene mm -hmm. pellets like on my wall like this and I, I had no idea how I could possibly get rid of all those, uh, all those garbage badges, so bags. So unfortunately, by chance there is no um, uh, how is it called that? An uh, environment friendly organization in the room because doing big fiberglass statues is not eco friendly at all. You use a lot of chemicals. There is no other way than using styrene to do your different types of styrene to do your original sculpture. You might have to get rid of it if you need to insert a metallic structure into it. So it creates a lot of pollution. It, it's not eco friendly. But I, I had no idea. We kind of found out by building it. So this is half of my uh, spider's body. If you want to go to the next, uh, and th this is the funny, the funny step. You just like take off all the, the excess of the little corners, and the little pellets glues to you because of the uh, Static. statics. So that was like, uh, until then it wasn't too bad. Go to the next picture. Then we started working on the legs. Uh, we used the 3D model we had to trace that two-dimensional pattern of the legs uh, with angles that we thought were really looking like uh, an insect. So this MDF board was like a, or basic template. That's what we used to create the first legs. Uh, the next step, we just used pieces of um, that same uh, styrene sheets that we glued it on each side of our MDF template and we just sculpted by hand the shapes of the legs. At this point, I, I told my boyfriend, we should do one big leg and one small, a small one, because we had decided to do two different shapes of legs. We wanted the front one and the back ones to be bigger and larger, and the four ones in the middle to be a little smaller, to make kind of a, to make it less symmetrical to, to create kind of a movement instead of having eight identical legs we would have two two different sizes so i said to my boyfriend we should sculpt only two a big one and a small one and then make a mold and and make cast we have enough copies to do to make it worth to to make a, a mold and a cast and my boyfriend said no no a mold will take so much material like did you see the size of that mold? I was like, yeah, it's going to be an expensive mold. It's pretty big, but I still think it's worth. Well, no, see how fast it was to slow just one? We can do it for the eight of them. It's going to be so fast. See, we just glued the, the siren sheets next to the to the MDF template, and it was so fast. I sculpted it like this. So I was like, okay, as you wish. I, I told you what I thought, but if you want, we can sculpt the eight of them. And we sculpted the eight of them to realize that it would have been way faster to make a mold and to make casts. Plus, since all the legs were sculpted by hand, they were not all exactly identical. So they're all like slightly different custom sculpted legs. But it doesn't really, it's not obvious when you look at the spider, but it was really a, a, a lot of time to sculpt them all separately. At this stage, you can see that we had glued it and, and, and sanded all the body of the spider, so it has the shape of a body already, and the legs are in place. So now you have the feel of a spider, you see where it's going and uh, I'm putting aluminum foil over the siren because we discovered while we were doing the robot that that's the proper, simpler, and cheapest way to isolate or to protect your uh, siren because polyesterism makes the siren melt like snow under the sun. You, you drop just a little drop of polyesterism on your siren and it's like so you, you literally lose all the time that you invest in sculpting your, your styrene. And we, we tried 
a whole lot of products wondering what we could possibly use to keep the polyesterism from, from making the styrene melt. And by searching a lot of, of like looking at an infinite amount of, uh, amount of things on the internet, we found out that professionals simply use aluminum foil. So it's super cheap and we glued it with them, um, a glue in a spray can. So that's the simplest and, and the easiest part of the project. So at that step, I was just like covering the whole thing with aluminum foil. Can we go to the next picture? Here we had uh, started uh, covering our legs with uh, little pieces of fiberglass mat and, and polyester resin. Again, there is way more efficient and, and, and fast faster ways to do that, but we couldn't afford it. There is actually a machine that works just like um, a spray gun for paint, but instead of spraying paint, it sprays resin and shredded uh, fiberglass mat at the same time. So, like, I looked online and those machines were like, I think, fifteen thousand or twenty thousand dollars. I was like, no, I'm not gonna purchase a fifteen thousand dollars fiberglass spraying like air gun whatever machine to do one robot in my whole life. So we did the robot just like we did the spider. Uh, purchasing fiberglass mat by the meter and shredding it in little pieces, soaking them with a brush and polyester resin, just like Mod Podge, you know, applying little pieces of fiberglass mat with the with the um, the brush on each and every square inch of the robot and the spider. That's why it took so much time because we, my shop isn't properly equipped to do such big pieces. You you need specialized equipment to do that. It, it, it should be like a, a, a job of a few weeks for a team of, of 10 or 15 people. It's not supposed to be that long, but since we are not properly equipped, we did everything by hand. At that moment, we had started integrating um, square tubing in the tip of the, of the legs because the legs we knew from the robot that Ninja Division didn't want a piece that would be like one big piece all welded together. They would have wished the robot to be um, possible to be disassembled, but we were not able to do this at that time. We didn't know how to do it, we didn't have enough time, so the robot was just one big solid piece that had to be carried with a forklift on a trailer. The, the spider, they had made it clear for us that they wanted, be, they wanted it to be possible to be disassembled. So we wanted to make the butt in one piece and the eight legs separated. We knew that fiberglass couldn't be fixed by itself to other fiberglass pieces. There, there's got to be some metal somewhere. So we had fixed inside the foam those square tubings of metal that would be later used to fix the legs to another metallic part hidden in, in the spider's building. We can go to the next picture. Oh, that's <laughs> me doing like snow angels and the siren pellets. So, and this is just like a tiny part of the floor of my, of my workshop, so imaging all the rest. I think that I found pellets in my workshop like six months later. Like it goes in every little corner. Every time you take your broom, there are pellets that you haven't seen the time before. So it looks it looks funny like that, but the pellets were actually full of um, fiberglass dust. And so I'm smiling, but it's just for the for the sake of social media. So this is uh, when we 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 realized that the body was so heavy, just the weight of the siren sheets themselves plus the fiberglass shell and, and the fact that it's round. I mean, it, it's so hard to manipulate something on, that you cannot grab because it's a, it's a, it's a sphere, it's a, a circular shape. So we realized that it was so heavy that we would have to do just like we did for the robot and, and take off the siren from the inside of the of the fiberglass shell. After all, you don't you don't need it. It's hidden in its side. It can be empty. It's just that you have to make a little surgery <laughs> to your fiberglass sculpture. And that's probably one of the only good sides of fiberglass is that you can purse it, make a hole, uh, take off a piece, put it back, use a um, body filler, and at the end, it won't show that you pierce something, or you, you can, it's possible to modify a fiberglass shape. It's just that it's a lot of work. So we literally cut a hole, 
in the spider's uh, body. And we started removing <laughs> with our hands and different tools, like breaking off the styron sheets inside to take it all off from the spider's body. And on the next picture, that's me with a guilty smile showing again all the styron that is going directly to the garbage, unfortunately. If you knew how many men, because I'm, I'm, uh, my workshop is in an industrial park, so all my neighbors are garages and, and welding companies and, and like regular shops that you find in, in, in an industrial park. So we were working with the garage door open because it's what it was summer, and the whole industrial park has been following the making of logs, stopping by, watching what you're doing here, and we're like the only shop in the industrial park to do something that is not related to garage and mechanics and stuff like that. If you knew how many men <laughs> stopped by to say, "Oh, all these pellets and all this tyrant, just put it on fire in a barrel." <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Do you imagine like the blue flame with the super dark few? I mean, the police is gonna stop by. And it's illegal. I don't want to do this. I know that putting them in garbage bags isn't. It's like maybe a little less worst. But I got that su that suggestion so often. So take care if you're surrounded by guys who are working in garages and mechanics because they like to set styrene on fire. So, on the next picture, you see the inside of the body and the, um, the aluminum foil that we glued it on the styrene to, to keep it from melting. It stayed glued in the fiberglass shell, so we didn't know it would do that, but it has absolutely no importance because it's hidden inside. You see a little bit of um, metallic tubing that is actually welded to a metallic plate hidden in the spider's belly that will be used to fix the legs on it. So later you will see how all this mechanical part of the spider works and the goal of having that metallic tubing going all the way through the body, it, we would later fix that part um, using more fiberglass mat to the inside of the body because we, we were afraid that when you look at it, at, I, and I know that there are like hundreds of different types of spider, but when we analyzed Ragnera, we saw that the legs are not all equally separate under her body. The, the legs all come out from the front of the body. So all the back of the body is actually holding in the air. So all the weight of the back of the body, we were afraid that we would, it, it might like, what if it would be so heavy that the little tail of the spider would whoop, do like this and, and, and would make a pressure on the legs? So we wanted to add that metallic tubing so the weight would be evenly, I don't know how to say that, but it would be fixed up to the end, up to the tail of the spider to make sure that there wouldn't be that pressure thing because you will see later how the legs are really starting from the front of the body and all the back of the body is literally holding by itself in the air. So that was the whole purpose of that piece of metal. So this is when we uh, put back that fiberglass piece that we had to cut out to be able to remove the styrene and we had made little, little notches just to make sure that it would realign properly um, before putting it back uh, you have to use a buffer to make the edges a little bit thinner because if you just add fiberglass mat around where you made that cutting, you will have a little layer, you will have that little thickness. You, you don't want to have a little thickness in the shape of a square, so it's obvious that, oh, there was something cut here. So you have to make some room to put this extra fiberglass mat that you're going to add, add to to hide that cutting pieces. So we had to use a buffer and, and make literally a, a little hole, a little line where the opening is that we would later fill up with fiberglass mats so it would be like perfectly even and all hidden. So now the body is laying on its back. So what you see on, on the top is actually the spider's body. and. It, it shows how fiberglass <coughs> looks bad until the really end of a process. There's nothing sexy in the making of a fiberglass piece because 
until the really end, you see the texture of, of the, the shredded fiberglass mat, uh, the fact that it's um, that caramel color is, is just the color of my polyester resin, but there are other colors. If I had pink polyester resin, it would have been a pink fiberglass thing. And that blue thing is the body filler. It has the color of the hardener that you put in it, but that's the same thing. They are hardeners of other colors, so it's just it just depend it just depends on the materials that you use. So at the end of the project, I was so tired to see blue because you're just like mixing body filler and mine was blue. So it's just like putting, I, I was feeling like a, like a cake maker, like someone in a pastry shop, like food coloring stuff with that creamy thing, body filler, body filler. When we started working with fiberglass, we thought that body filler was used only to correct the shapes. So if you had a little hole, you would fill up with body filler. But then we quickly realized that when you send body filler, it sends really easily. And when you send a, p a place where you didn't put any body filler, where it's just directly the fiberglass, it's so hard to send. And we later learned that the trick is to cover the whole thing with body filler. If it doesn't need any correction, if the shape is good, you just put a tiny layer. And if you have a huge bump, you can add a lot. So you never want to send fiberglass mat itself. You want to send body filler. So once your fiberglass thing is done, you will put body filler all over. You cover the whole thing. And once it's all covered with body filler, it, it stopped itching. It's the part of the project that is more tolerable <laughs> because body filler dust doesn't it doesn't itch your skin, while fiberglass dust when it, it deposits itself on your skin, this is what is so itchy. So now that we knew this, we started covering the whole thing with with body filler. And since it's a it's a, it's a sculpture made by hand, you see that it's all uneven and the fact that we were placing all these little pieces of fiberglass mat one by one it's not perfectly even so we really didn't use the fastest or the easiest way to do it we did it so it's a proof that it can work but it's really not the, the most efficient way to do it so hey body filler step after this we started making some tests and my bar friend was afraid that the original little square tubings that we inserted in the big legs wouldn't be strong enough to hold me. It had a lot of, I don't know how to say, a lot of spring. <laughs> when I would be sitting on the spider, if I would just move a little bit, the whole structure was doing like this. But it would hold. I mean, it was like one by one square inch, uh, one by one inch square tubing. And it would have probably hold. But at the same time, this piece was to go in a convention where people would come by to take themselves in picture with the spider. Uh, we didn't want the spider to fall on the floor while I would be sitting on it. We didn't want the spider to, to fall down on anybody in the convention. So my boyfriend decided to not to risk anything and to start the whole thing all over again and to insert in the, in the legs that were done at that point bigger tubing, like round tubing that we had bended in a specialized company. And these were <laughs> almost indestructible. In a metallic structure, the weakness will always be the weldings. In a, in a leg like this, you only have one weld. The rest is bended, so the rest is super strong. So these were like indestructible. With four like this, I could probably like someone that is 300 pounds could have been sitting on the, on the spider and it wouldn't have been a problem. So it was more than enough to support the weight of the spider itself and my own weight. However, it means that we had to open the previous legs that were done, remove the MDF template that was still inside and put back those new shapes, metallic shapes inside or fiberglass shell in the shape of a legs. So we took a, a couple step forward, backward, and we lost some time, but it was really for safety reasons. We wanted to make sure that, that it would hold in place. You can go to the next picture. So before 
opening like all the legs we wanted to make sure that our new idea would work so we, we tested it with the naked legs if you want so just the internal structure and the fiberglass body and now you can see very well how the legs come out from the front part of the body itself all the back part of the body holds in the air so it could have been very heavy what if it would have done like that <laughs> what if it would have rip the legs apart because of the weight of, of the back of the body. So that's why we had that metallic plate, that metallic tubing that you saw a little bit earlier that was going all the way through to the end of the tail of the spider. And we had such a hard time to lift that thing in the air and to install it on the four legs. We realized at that point that we would have to be very creative to find a way to assemble it by ourselves because we knew that at Anime Expo, when we would be setting the booth, there would be no one to help us. Like the volunteers would already be uh, busy having Soda Pop Miniatures booth done. We couldn't count on the fact that people would help us. So we really had to find a way to, to be able to assemble it, just the two of us. So, and you're gonna see later, it's a very creative way. It's not easy to understand, but it, 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 was, it was a brilliant idea that allowed us to manipulate all these pieces all by ourselves. So at this point, we knew that it was working and it was strong enough. So you can go to the next picture. So now on the floor, you can see that there's a piece of metal coming out from the spider's tail and it's fixed to that other metallic thing to the floor. Our plan was to carry the spider body by fixing it in the floor of the box, if I might say. So this metallic thing would be useful to keep the, the body of the spider in place in the box, because if you don't want it to move in the box while, while it would be carried in the truck, and it would be useful to allow us to insert the legs under it. It's part of the mechanic that I'm gonna explain later. That front part, you, you see kind of a tri metallic triangle. It was also part of the mechanic that we developed to be able to lift up the body in the air. Because we evaluated from, I, we, I didn't personally lifted it, but we, evalu we evaluated that it was probably weighting somewhere around 300 or 350 pounds. So it was obvious that we couldn't just like take it in our hand and lift it in the air while I insert the leg under it. it we had to have a, a mechanical process to hold the body in the air while we would be fixing each leg one by one. So these metallic things that you're seeing were part of that mechanic that I will explain later. So this is when we uh, inserted the metallic legs in the fiberglass shells that we had already done. So now it, it started to look more and more like a spider. And you see the shape of the, um, of the seat that we designed uh, to reproduce Ragnarok's look. I, I, I couldn't be sitting like this. I had to be sitting really next to the front of the spider. And my, I, was, I was afraid that it wouldn't be very comfortable. But what I hadn't thought of is that the fact that my legs were dangling in the air was the less comfortable part of the whole process. Having the weight of my leg pulling me down was putting so much pressure here under my tights that it, they would become like all numb after five minutes. And I was like, I'm sitting there just for five minutes. What it, how is it going to be in the, in the convention? And uh, my girlfriend said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something, let me think of something. And we added, you see here, those two little shapes, like two little pieces that are coming slightly out from the seat. They were meant to support my tights a little bit, and those two little pieces really made a difference. They were supporting my legs. Then I was still falling down from the seat. So we added that shape here that would like touching my crotch while I was sitting a little bit like a tractor seat kind of designed to fit someone's booty. And it really allowed me to keep my balance on the seat without falling down because of the weight of my legs. So that's the most comfortable fiberglass seat that we could think of. 
but honestly, it was still very uncomfortable. I, I couldn't have asked any other cosplayer to sit on that. We made it because we knew that I would be the one uh, supporting the whole thing. Because <laughs> nobody else would have accepted to sit on that for hours. It was, uh, if we would have like paid an actress like or someone well known, they would have they would have said that it, it were not they were not acceptable conditions to work in. It was really not comfortable. So you have like another point of view where you can see um, that hole in the seat uh, was it, it was like a little lid that we could take off, and we would have uh, we would access the inside of the spider body, so that uh, that way we would be able to uh, fix and bolt the legs. So they, they would be inserted under the body and we would put her hand inside the body and weld them. So that lid or that hole was hidden by me <laughs> when I was sitting on it. <laughs> and it was also very useful to carry tools inside because before we exported the spider to the USA, we put inside the seat all the tools that we needed so we knew that they wouldn't get lost or anything. Everything was exported at the same time hidden inside. So that's, there was like so much engineering going on in, in that spider just because of the fact that it had to be disassembled while the robot was just one big solid piece. It was, the engineering of the robot was easier in a certain way since it was just one big block. So this is um, the, another type of lid. This is actually the spider's belly because we had found a way to fix the legs <coughs> under the spider, but then you don't want to see it because the spider is so high that everybody who would come close to the spider to, to be taking a picture next to it, their eyes would be right at the height of the legs. So you don't want to see the metallic tubing coming out from the spider's legs with the bolts under the spiders, but I mean, it's not beautiful. You don't want to see that. We had to find a way to make a nice finishing and to hide that mechanic. So this was like a, the, the other half of the spider's belly that would come off and that would hide all the metallic tubing coming out from, from the legs. So there were a lot of pieces that we would have to take off to be able to assemble and disassemble the spider. So that's the... You can see like the opening, the space here between the two parts, this is where the legs would be inserted. So when you would look at the spider closely, you could see that, that opening that was hiding the legs. What we did is that we filled it up with fake fur so it looked like a hairy spider and it would fill up that, that little gap here. But that's the, the only way we found as a camouflage to be able to, to do a thing that would be disassemb possi possible to disassemble. Oh, that's one more. I don't, I don't remember why I put this one there. It's okay. just like, hey, that's right, Nira. OK, now you have a very clear look of how the, the legs would, would be fixed. Uh, the spider is laying on its back, so you're seeing what is hidden under the, the spider's belly. And you see very clearly the new big metallic legs, the, se the second ones that we made, the very big circular tubing, and how they were bolted to that metallic plate that continues up to the spider tails. And now you understand better where it was needed to have a hole on the other side because I would insert my hand to screw the other side of those bolts. So that's probably like the clearest image that you can have of, of the mechanic of the spider. So you can clearly see that we had like eight separate legs and one body and one lid for the spider's belly. And that's me proudly sitting on my spider now that it was looking more and more like a, like a final product. And we realized that it was easier to send the legs while they were on that, on that position. So we let the spider laying on its back. I don't even remember how we possibly, we flip it in a way, and we fixed the legs. And I was like, hey, it's, it's easier to send that way. 
let, let's keep it on let's keep it on that side for a little while and we were able to do a nice finish on each of the legs this way and now you see very clearly the little join between the the upper part of the spider belly and and the lid and this is just a circular opening that we left to be able to have the legs coming out from the spider. And this is where we inserted Pfeiffer, kind, kind of, of a way to hide those very clear openings because that's exactly the height of people's house. In the convention, like I was sitting at five feet from the ground, so my legs were somewhere here and the spider's legs were just there. So it has to look good because th this would be what people would see the most with the legs, of course. So this was probably the, the most complicated thing to finish. It was a lot of fine tuning, uh, like the legs from the back, uh, we had to make a bigger hole here because we had to open the spider's legs more. They were too close next to each other and it wasn't stable enough. So we wanted to take the last leg and bring it back Arthur, but then we had, it, it was touching the body, we couldn't bring it back more, so we had to take the buffer again and, and remove some, some fiberglass and make some hole to be able to push that big leg like farther. So it, like adjusting those openings was probably the most complicated part in the whole fiberglass process. Just one more picture of Maya. You see the okay? We were right, okay, this one is good enough. Okay, this one is done. So we would just like write little notes why we, why we would be going. So you see the, oh, these are the, oh, it's not super clear, but these are the products that we used. Uh, this is um, uh, the primer, the base coat. It's a very good high coverage base coat used in the automotive industry. So uh, this one is great and it fills up all the little, the last little holes that you have in your fiberglass surface. So in the robot, we realized that we were sending way too much because some of the last little holes would be all filled up by that very high quality base coat. So, but it, there's a huge difference between that base coat and any primer that you can uh, buy in a hardware store, like any spray cans. It, it's, it's really, really high coverage and it works so well. It's just like pretty expensive. They, they sell it with automotive paint in, in, in specialized hardware store and specialized um, painting stores. So, and you need, a, you need a spray gun to apply it, but it works super well. Well, so at that step, we were at the step of applying the base coat, and usually you need, you need what they call a paint room to do that. Mm -hmm. So proper garages have a, a nice big room where there's nothing. There's just a very good ven ventilation system, and you can paint whatever you want. Is it like your collection car or regular car? You're just entering in the paint room, and it's okay if there's paint fume on the walls because this is a paint room and that's what it's meant for. However, I don't have a paint room in my garage because I have a sewing room and it, it, it wasn't meant to, to I, I didn't know that in my life I, I would build such big fiberglass pieces. So I'm just not equipped to do that. And after the robot, I knew, I mean, it sounds kind of obvious that when you, you do spray paint you're gonna have fumes but I think I had just not realized how much fume it would do so after we painted the robot there was like that slight coat of yellow all over my workshop I was like okay it really goes everywhere everything is yellow <laughs> so when we painted the spider I used uh, the same plastic sheets that they sell uh, for um, for automotive painting. Uh, let's say that you had a, a scratch on your car door and you have to have the door repaint, but just the door, not the whole car. They will actually cover your car 
with those very, very large plastic sheets and they will make an opening just inside of the door and they will repaint only the door. So these sheets are like insanely wide because they're, they're wide enough to hide a whole car or a truck. So they were very useful because I used them to cover all the walls of my workshop. I carefully closed the door of my swim room, sealed it to make sure that no paint fume would go inside. And we kind of limited the damages. And um, automotive paint it is one of those very toxic things. You cannot, I mean, it happened, even though I'm not supposed to, that I worked with, with fiberglass without wearing a mask. You can't, you, it's really bad for your health. But I kind of got used to the smell of, of polyester resin, so I was like, whatever. Because those masks make my skin look so bad. And then it's okay if my boyfriend has like pimples or whatever because he's been wearing a mask like, 10 hours a day, he won't be called for an interview, he won't have like to show up to the camera. So I was like putting together two jobs that don't go together. The fact that I had to wear those masks every day was making my skin look so bad. And then what if I had like a public appearance to do? I would hide everything with more makeup that would damage my skin even more. And then the day after I would put back, put back my mask. So at some point I was like, it's, it's, it's a, bad choice, but I'm going to have to vote for aesthetic. And I stopped wearing a mask while I was working with fiberglass. You're not supposed to do that. But for paint fume, it's just not tolerable. I mean, it, it's, it, you cannot breathe. It, it is so intensively toxic. It, it, it's just impossible. You really, really, really have to wear a mask with the proper filters. And since there's fume that goes everywhere, it means that it's gonna go in your clothes as well. So I was wearing one of those very sexy X-Files, furious, whatever type of white. You, you look like a scientist, like getting through a, an infected, infected zone. But that's really, that's really what you have to wear when you, when you do such a big paint job. So at that step, we had to think of a way to hold the legs in place, because obviously you cannot say like, hey, hold, hold the leg while I'm painting it. First of all, they're super heavy, and I mean, there is one way where I'm, where I'm gonna have to take off my hand so you can put, I, it's just like, how are we gonna do? So my boyfriend came up with that idea of just welding together that very simple display, and the legs, that were already designed to be bolted under the belly of the spider were just literally bolted to that metallic temporary hanging thing. So we were able to paint the legs that way. And now I was getting really excited because when we applied the black paint, I, I don't like spiders, okay? I'm afraid of spiders in real life. And when I saw the legs with their angles and, and the black color, I had kind of a, a song. Mm -hmm. so I was like, oh, yeah, they, they, they really look like a real spider. So I think we, 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 we really succeed. It, it, it really looks like a real spider. So yeah, I was excited. Because paint means that you're closer to the end. So that, that's good news. <laughs> okay, so here you have a better idea of how we would process to lift and move that body. So I'm gonna try to explain it with words and it's not gonna be easy, but imagine that this is fixed to the bottom of the transportation box and this is folded under the, the spider. So what we would do is that this piece is here would move, it's like a, moves like this. So we would unfold the triangle and lift the front of the spider body. So it would be like this. Because that little joint here, it's like a, not swivel, but I mean it, it moves. So this part would be fixed to the bottom of the box. This, pieces, this, the, this piece here would unfold and we would be able to lift just the front part of the body. So we would be able to fix the two front legs. And then we would unscrew this and bring it here. And we would be able to do the same thing, unfold the triangle, lift the back of the body of the, of the spider, 
and fix the two back legs. And now the spider would be holding on the four legs and we would be able to remove our, our triangle and we would be able to fix the four middle legs. So that way we, we, we figured out that we would be able to assemble it just the two of us. In the end, it didn't work and we needed to be three, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you the story at the end. So this is when we painted the body in black and anybody who's a professional painter will immediately notice that there's kind of a texture in the reflection, which means that the, the paint is not perfect. That kind of a orange skin texture is not supposed to be like that. Uh, the fact that I don't have a paint room, that there could have been dust in the air, uh, that my, may, maybe the, the air gun wasn't set properly, but I mean, we're not professional painters, that's not what I do for a living. I've done two big fiberglass statues in my life, so there had to be some little flaws and defects, so most of people don't notice it, but this, this is like really obvious for any professional painter. But I was still very happy to be so close to the end. So Ratnera has that skull pattern on, on, its, on her back. Uh, so that's the very last thing that we did. Uh, on June 20, when we were actually waiting for the trucker to arrive uh, in front of the workshop and, <laughs> and take the spider and export it to the USA. To the USA. So I, I just had the time to take the pattern, uh, do the white paint, and we thought that, oh, you, you, you can recognize that uh, plastic sheet. So that's a little bit the same process when, when they do um, a paint job on a car or with, if you want to have like a pattern on your car or, or on your, I don't know, motorcycle, whatever. You, you cover what you don't want to be painted with that plastic and you hope that there is not a little hole in it nowhere. And you use a special type of tape uh, you cannot use the tape that we use when, let's say that you want to paint that room and you want the ceiling and the wall to be different colors, you will use that masking tape. It's not the same type of masking tape. It's a more expensive but very efficient um, latex type of masking tape and it makes those, those like super nice, very clear lines in the pattern. If you try to do it with the paper masking tape that we use to paint, when you, when you will take it off, the edges are like this. So it's really a specific masking tape made for automotive paint. It's like seven dollars a little. No, I think it was like fifteen dollars a little roll. It's like super expensive, but it really works well. You, you see that it, it was meant to do that. So we use that that tape to do the the pattern of the skull, and then on the on the next pick, I think I'm I'm painting it. Yeah, I was applying the the white paint with my X file suit. <laughs> and then in the next picture, we didn't have the time to let the paint set, uh, to let the paint dry. We, we hope, we wish that we would have had the time to remove the tape and remove the plastic. But when the tracker arrived, we had just finished the, the, the white paint. So, I mean, we were so last minute, there was no, mo no more time. So we just built the box over the spider that was already fixed to the bottom of the box. We added the, the, uh, the lid and we just said goodbye <laughs> to the spider's body while the paint was still drying and we shipped it like this to the USA. <laughs> so this is when we arrived uh, at Anime Expo and you see clearly, you recognize that little metallic part that was screwed in the bottom of the box and at that step, we had used the triangle metallic thing and the body was like that. It was lifted in the air and the two front legs were installed already. Uh, we thought that we would be able to do it, just the two of us, but we were very lucky. We have a, a French Canadian guy, a friend of us, who now lives in Los Angeles and he was available on the weekend of Anime Expo and he said, oh, I want to see that thing that you built. I'm going to go there and I'm going to help you. And by chance he was there because even though we had that mechanic, we still needed to be very strong to be able to lift it. And one of the front legs alone with the metallic tubing inside was probably weighing around 60 pounds. So I was just strong enough to hold one of those legs 
And by chance, there were like my boyfriend and my friend to lift up the body. And I mean, you have to have someone who is keeping the balance, someone who is holding the leg, and someone who's screwing it. I mean, I just have two hands. <laughs> so the minimum amount of people that we we had to be to make it possible was three people. So by chance, our friends were was with us in Los Angeles. <coughs> so that I took a picture of the top of the spider, there was like, uh, it was the day before Anime Expo when all, all the exhibitors are installing their things and you have like packaging and, 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 and boxes everywhere. So I actually climbed on a pile of boxes and I took a picture of the top of Ragnera because I realized that it was so high that the pattern, the skull pattern wasn't even showing. Nobody, uh, unless you would be like six feet, six feet tall, maybe or taller, you could notice little bits of white paint on the top of the spider, but other way, nobody really. We could, we could, have, we could have skipped that step, and I don't think that nobody would have noticed. So I wanted to take at least one picture of the top of, of the spider to have a souvenir of that skull that that set dry in the transportation <laughs> truck, and that was that was the other surprise. We knew when we. Uh, unpacked the spider that we would have to remove the tape and the plastic but it would be 10 days later the spider left Quebec on June 20 and Anime Expo was on July 1 or 4 so it was really like 10 days later so I was like how is the paint going to look 10 days later? Will, will the, the tape be stuck in the paint? Will we be able to remove the whole thing? And finally, it worked super well. But I guess we're not supposed to start painting something and remove the masking tape 10, day, 10 days later. It was really like exceptional. So it worked. I took a little picture of the skull, and that was it. And that's me when I met Okayado. I, I was so focused on making the spider in those two months that I didn't really make any, I, I think I didn't even went on Anime Expo's website. I didn't look at any guests. I had no idea. I was just making that thing and I wanted to, to deliver it on time. So while I was at the hotel room, I was reading my mails and one guy from Japan sent me an email and said, I hope that you're gonna have to meet Okayado in person and he says he's been following you while we were making it. So I was like, what is this guy? I, I, I didn't understand. It, it took me a little while before my brain processed information and I went on Anime Expo's website and I just learned at that moment, the day before Anime Expo, that Okayado, the writer and creator of the manga, was one of the guests. And that's at this moment that I learned that he had been retweeting because Japan is the only country on earth where uh, Twitter is the most popular social media. If everywhere else, it's either like Instagram or other, but in Japan, for a reason or another, the social media that they use the most is Twitter. So, okay, Edo is on Twitter, and he was sharing the making of, so he knew that a, an unknown Canadian girl on the other side of the planet was building a cosplay of his character. And during the weekend, he came, and he speaks only Japanese, so he had uh, his uh, translator, a woman who was speaking English and Japanese, and we took a picture together. And since I was wearing red lenses, I, I need lenses, but with a lot of strength in them, and I, I was wear wearing red lenses without any strength, so basically I saw everything blurry during the whole anime expo. So I could not even see how Akayado looks, until I saw the picture, because without my glasses and without proper lenses, I cannot even see your, your faces at this distance. <laughs> so I knew that I was next to a Kayado, but everything was just so blurry. And I finally saw how he looks when I look at the picture later that night. So that's me <laughs> proudly sitting on my spider. You can see that what we finally decided to do is that we made fiberglass pieces that they were not even boots, they were even they were just like decorative pieces that we would put on my legs and on my knees to 
kind of integrate my legs in the background. They were, they had the same finish than the spider because they were the same material and we used the same paint. So most of people who were coming around were like, oh, I didn't notice your legs because they just look so much like the rest of the spider. So they were there, they were just like in your face, but they were so well integrated to the rest of the design that this is how we, we finally figured out that issue. And the, the costume is probably the simplest and, and, and the I mean, I, I made that costume so fast. I, I've never sewed something that fast because I had no time left before Anime Expo. So um, this is a good example of, of a costume where I'm prouder of the prop than the costume itself. The only part that I'm really proud of are the latex pens. Um, I did something that not a lot of people do to recreate those holes here. There is uh, some see-through mesh and that technique is not very well known because la latex is the same material that I'm wearing right now and latex only sticks to latex. So to be able to insert fabric in latex, we had to develop a technique that is not well known and that's actually the only secret that I don't reveal. <laughs> it's technically very complicated. Not a lot of um, latex companies specialize for uh, fetishes people or whatever. There's a lot of latex clothing on, online and uh, mixing fabric and latex is extremely rare on the market. Uh, probably that they haven't figured it out or it wouldn't be profitable because it's very long. So it's like among all the, the techniques that I developed and explored in my work as a costumer, it's the only technical secret that I keep for myself. <laughs> But uh, the pants are my favorite part of the costume itself. And one final pic of me sitting in the, on my rack mirror. The first day, because uh, Anime Expo was four days, the first day I stayed on, this, on the spider for the whole day. And the days after I realized that I would still feel the pain from the day before. So I thought if it just adds up like this and each day I'm suffering more than the day before, I don't know how I'm gonna survive to this. So the three other days, I stayed on the spider for two blocks of two hours. That's the most I was able to do. I would stay there two hours and then have a one hour break and go back on the, on the spider for two more hours because the pressure of having the weight of my own legs pulling me down it would make, it, it, it's very weird. I, I felt what it is to be paralyzed for a few seconds. They had to put a ladder in front of the spider so I was able to climb in and, and go down. And when they brought the ladder, my brain sent a message to my legs to like lift your legs and, and it didn't respond. I was so, that zone was so numb, so engourdi that I wasn't able to move my, I had to take my leg with my hands like this to put it on the ladder and finally be able to go down. So I haven't expected it to be that worst and I would have never asked it to any other girl to sit there, but it's still one of the projects that I'm the most happy about because it was so fantastic. <laughs> so this is it, that, that's the story behind that era. Thank you so much for having, uh, for your patience. I know it took a little while before I started that, that panel, but I hope this was worth. Uh, it's not easy for me to explain such technical stuff in a, a language that isn't my, my mother tongue, but I hope that even though I don't, I don't always have the proper English word, I hope that you understood what I meant. And thanks for your interest. It's, it's an honor for me to know that something that I've been working on actually interests other people. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of the 2018 Cornwall and Area Pop event. Please like, comment, and subscribe to see more. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.